my mother uh, was very definitely an atheist, and because of unfortunate background in her childhood and early girlhood of having her father attempt to beat religion into her on a daily basis, she made up her mind that I would not be forced into anything of that sort. So she tried to lay the groundwork for, for me and keep me free of that. Queen Silver was a very close friend of mine. She was one of the founding members of Atheist United, which I'm currently co-president. And she was a elderly lady when I met her for the first time, I guess maybe about 80 years old or so. And she was absolutely fascinating to talk to. Her mind just seemed to go from one area of expertise to another. And so there just didn't seem to be any area that she didn't have some pertinent knowledge of. As mother taught me at home, and by the time I was eight, I could read anything that she could read in the English language. And we had a large library of free thought books and progressive and radical books. Uh, to which I had access, and Mother never barred me from reading anything except that she said she would prefer that I not read fairy stories until I was old enough to know the difference between fact and fiction. And she would also have preferred that I not read the Bible until I was somewhat older. From the time she was first able to read, I guess when she was about six years old, she just went through book after book after book in the library, in Los Angeles Public Library. And by the time she was about seven or eight years old, she'd read every book that was worth reading, according to her mother, in the library. And at least in the section where, that she frequented. The guy from the local library said that she was instrumental in getting the library going in her area. She went around and, as a kid and petitioned people to you know, sign up and help out with the new library. She was born in Portland, Oregon in 1910. And her mother was Grace Silver, who was a lecturer at the time and they would go from train to train going back and forth and lecture and she would lecture all over the place and so Queen was hitting the lecture circuit very early in life. Well my mother was a traveling speaker and lecturer in the progressive politics and women's rights issues and incidentally more incidentally than otherwise in the matter of free thought but she was a, a, a free thinker and an atheist, and that was part of her work. She was also doing some freelance writing during that period. She said in San Pedro there was an IWW meeting. San Pedro, California was a hotbed of IWW activities, and if you go to both the ACLU website as well as the IWW website, you will find vintage articles of how various groups ranging from the Ku Klux Klan to the American Legion would go in and bust up IWW meetings, and one of these meetings uh, busted up by the American Legion was just so violent that a, a child was killed. Uh, these people were going in there and busting up union meetings, and uh, and they went in and they actually killed a kid. And uh, Queen Silver was, um, you know, she was there. <laughs> And so she was saying, you just can't believe, you know, the way these people were. It's just, and the police didn't intercede, you know, they were, uh, they were helping them out. So, uh, you know, she told me about all these sort of historical things that you don't hear about in normal history or in the history in school books. When I was doing research for this project, I was uh, talking to a lady at the store that I was trying to acquire some photographs from, and I had mentioned to her that Queen Silver was a child when an IWW meeting was raided by the American Legion. And this lady responded, well, what was a child doing at an IWW meeting? And I tried to explain to this lady, well, you know, in those days, it's not like you had uh, child care available to everybody, and, um, and this lady was still doing it, well, you know, an IWW meeting is no place for a child. Well, Grace Silver, according to Wendy's book, did not try to hide the harsh realities of life from young Queen Silver, and she took her everywhere. She also said there was a free speech area in L.A. that she used to go to, and, uh, you know, people could get up and say anything, but I guess people were saying things that were too radical, so they bulldozed it. The free speech zone is an area 
that used to exist in Los Angeles that was moved around to quite a few different places where anybody could show up with their soapbox or their flyers and their pamphlets and speak and try to rally people to their point of view. Uh, what's interesting is that even though you would have your basic street preachers who would be there preaching the Christian gospel, they would really be met with relatively little persecution. Oh yeah, you'd still get things like, you know, random drunks coming in maybe saying something, but by and large, the police would be backing them up. But if you were speaking about atheism, number one, because of the anti-religious nature of it, about atheism, and number two, because of the link atheism had with Bolshevism in many people's minds, generally the police could not be counted on to back you up and to defend your rights. And Queen spoke of many times of people just uh, coming in and harassing her and her mother as they would speak. One of the more uh, harrowing stories involved a truck that just made a beeline for them, and Grace Silver managed to jump off her soapbox in time before the truck careened into them, killing two people and injuring several others. Well, I went and tried to find the location of this free speech zone, and the closest I could find was near the train station at the end of Oliveira Street. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that in 1908, a woman named Dorothy Johns, along with three other women, were arrested for using the streets of L.A. to basically preach socialism, or I should say lecture on socialism, and they were arrested. And sure enough, um, their case resulted in freedoms being guaranteed, not just to the people preaching the Christian gospel, but to people advocating any point of view. So I'm going up and down the streets of Los Angeles looking for any remnants of tribute to these three brave, free-thinking women, and I can't find a one. And the closest tribute I can find is this monument to Billy Graham <laughs> outside of the courthouse, which uh, you know, gives him credit for uh, hosting a meeting where a gangster was allegedly saved and he um, made a movie about it. And so we give him credit for making a bunch of religious movies. Um, you know. Wow, I'm sure that sacrifice did America a lot of good. She never hesitated to tell free thinkers such as myself today that we are very fortunate in that we don't have to deal with some of the perversions and atrocities that were dealt to free thinkers during her day back in the 1920s and 30s. But it is at the present time in most instances physically safe to be an atheist. Whereas at the time when I was growing up, this was not the case. And I have seen, for example, I've seen an atheist speaker down on the ground with a religionist pounding his head against the sidewalk. However, unfortunately, although atheists usually seem to respect the rights of religious parents and don't proselytize, this is not true of religious people as far as atheist children. So very early on, uh, there were attempts to convert me or to instruct me in the things that obviously my mother was not instructing me. One story that she told me that I'd like to relate I think is rather interesting. This is when she was still very young, possibly seven or eight years old. Her, they were staying at, she and her mother were staying at a motel and Queen came down early one morning ahead of her mother and she was sitting in the lobby there and this gentleman came up to her and started preaching the gospel to her and Queen listened for a while and then she then he asked her what she thought of what he was saying she said mister you have to be awfully ignorant to believe that <laughs> elderly gentleman said uh, uh, something to her about evolution and how this is uh, you know nonsense and that uh, um, you know, all that, and, and she turned to him and said, if you believe that, mister, you're more ignorant than you look. <laughs> and then she'd laugh, you know, and... Uh... And I had to learn how to talk back, and I had to know the reasons why I was saying certain things and the intellectual background. So then I got my background through the lectures of Robert Ingersoll, and the writings of Voltaire and Thomas Paine and Volney's Ruins of Empires and numerous other books of that kind. She was best known, I think, in her early days for publishing a magazine, Queen Silver's Magazine. And when I say early days, I mean very early days because she was only about 
I think, 10 or 11 years old when she began publishing the magazine. And she was known as the child atheist debater in those days. This was about 1920 or 22. And during the, fa the famous Scopes Monkey trial of 1925, she actually publicly challenged William Jennings Bryan to a debate on evolution. And Mr. Bryan refused to partake in this, but I think it would have been rather interesting. Between the ages of 12 to 15, actually younger, younger than that, I believe even around 8 years old, Queen was actually giving lectures, and she was like a little moppet, a little Shirley Temple, you might say, uh, being sat on a table and speaking about the most amazing things, from the theory of relativity before it was published to uh, evolution, and her, her lectures were printed in magazines, and one of her lectures were even printed in and distributed at Dayton, Ohio, during the height of the Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, Luther Burbank, famed botanist, um, actually praised one of her essays on the theory of relativity, and it was pretty much close to the margin. Um, she had actually challenged William Jennings Bryan to a debate, and Bryan declined, but if you read some of Queen's essays written at extra, the extremely young age of 12 to 13, it would have been pretty humiliating for Bryant, I think. Nearly a year ago, William Jennings Bryan, writing in the New York Times, said to defenders of evolution, come down out of the trees and discuss the subject. As soon as I read this challenge, I wrote an open letter to Brian, challenging him to debate with me upon the subject of evolution. He has never made any reply, other than to say that he will not debate with anyone who does not accept the story of creation laid down by Moses in the book of Genesis. In other words, Brian says that he will not debate with anyone who knows more than himself. I climbed down from my tree especially to debate with Brian. And what did I find? I find that this only surviving troglodyte, now remaining in America, has gone into his hole and pulled the hole in after him. I have often wondered why man, who is generally supposed to have a brain much superior to that of other any animal, should cling to the superstitions of his ignorant, savage ancestors. She did tell me about the film, too, that uh, when she was going to, uh, I think it was Hollywood High School, and uh, the, uh, she put out a she put out some kind of a magazine for the advancement of atheism or something and uh, and I guess this got in the press here and it inspired uh, um, one of the major movie directors to make a film called uh, The Latheist or something like that. The Goggles Girl was one of those cases where a movie was really based on the headlines of the day not necessarily on the reality of what was actually happening at the beginning of The Godless Girl, Cecil B. DeMille's movie screams with headlines about atheist groups taking over high schools. Well, as Wendy points out, the reality is that no school at the time would allow any atheist group to meet in a high school because atheism was linked to Bolshevism. No one would allow that. But still, like the satanic abuse scares in the late 80s and the early 90s, um, there was an atheist scare, and the newspapers picked up on this, and Cecil B. DeBell based this entire movie on the legends perpetrated by the news media at the time. She was the basis for the character, the lead character in Cecil B. DeMille's movie, The Godless Girl, which was released in 1929. Cecil B. DeMille in his autobiography said that he based The Godless Girl on articles that he read in the paper regarding activism that was going on at the nearby Hollywood High. Now the only activism, atheist or otherwise, that was going on in Hollywood High was the result of Queen and Grace Silver passing out atheist documents and flyers to the students trying to get an atheist group started in the high school. Well, what happened was a bunch of Christian students decided to go and um, basically hassle their meeting. They showed up at Grace and Queen Silver's meeting, and then just as the meeting began, they got up and left in protest, thus leaving Grace and Queen there in an empty room, uh, rather humiliated by this little incident. Well, in the movie The Godless Girl, a similar incident occurs. What happens is uh, the Godless Girl is 
bringing her pamphlets and flyers to school, putting them in the lockers, and the magazine that she's carrying bears a distinct resemblance to the old Queen Silver's magazine. She does have her meeting. Christians do come to this meeting in mass to protest. However, unlike leaving peacefully as occurred originally in the real atheist meeting, uh, violence erupts in the Cecil B. DeMille meeting, a stairway collapses, and a young girl is killed in this meeting, much like a young girl was killed at the IWW meeting that Queen Silver had attended, which was broken up by the American Legion. Unfortunately, that film's not widely available, and cinematically treated, the heroine of the film ends up being converted to Christianity, which was, of course, not the case with Queen, who was not only a lifelong atheist, but a pioneering feminist, daughter of a pioneering feminist in turn. It's interesting to note that the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism protested the Godless Girl. This is pointed out in Cecil B. DeMille's autobiography. Even before the movie came out, atheists of the day knew that they were going to be in for a ribbing. I, I've never seen the film. I'd love to see it. And I've heard that when they showed it in Russia, they cut off the end because Cecil B. DeMille put an end on it where, you know, she finally converts or something, but they left that off in Russia. But The Goddess Girl did great business in Russia, mainly because the ending was cut off, thus turning it into a piece of unintentional atheist propaganda by Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> anyway, the movie bombed terribly in the United States, but it was not because of the subject matter. It was because of the inclusion of sound. Cecil B. DeMille wanted to keep up, or I should say his studio wanted to keep up. Cecil B. DeMille in his autobiography uh, gives us the appearance that he was against adding sound at the end of this movie. But they added sound that increased the budget, and consequently, this movie bombed terribly at the box office. However, what is interesting is that Wendy McElroy indicates that Queen Silver and Grace Silver worked as movie extras up until the advent of sound. Now, this brings the interesting question. If they worked as movie extras until the advent of sound, and if The Godless Girls was one of the last of the silent movies, could it be that Queen Silver was an extra in a movie based on her own life? I have not yet received a response, pro or con, either way on that one, but it is an interesting thought, to say the least. Cecil B. DeMille, in his autobiography, was writing about the Godless Girl. In his autobiography, which was written sometimes in the 50s, he's looking back at the Godless Girl, which was made in the latter 20s. And he said that what he regarded as the most anachronistic thing about the Godless Girl wasn't the fact that it was a silent movie, nor the fact that there was a crude attempt to add sound to it, but the idea that there was a teen atheist group meeting in high schools. He found that to be totally anachronistic since the teens in his day, uh, we're talking around the 50s when his autobiography was written, were pretty much apathetic. Well, as Wendy points out in her book, and as I've just explained, there never really was a major atheist movement in America's high schools back during the 20s. A lot of that was just a bunch of uh, bogus press hype. However, in spite of himself, Cecil B. DeMille does make a very valid point. The atheist movement has undergone a lot of changes since the days of Queen Silver back in the 20s. For instance, if you were a free market capitalist, you would probably have been uh, in the minority in Queen circles, to say the least. If you were even the least bit skeptical of the claims of religion, you would generally find yourself um, fraternizing with socialists, because those were pretty much the only people who were out at the time questioning the claims of religion. But today, in the organized atheists, humanists, and uh, free thought and rationalists and skeptical groups, you will find a wide variety of political thought. Uh, ranging from free market economists to libertarians to socialists, and I've even run into a few Goldwater Republicans myself. But Cecil B. DeMille does make a very valid point in spite of believing his own BS, and that is that in the days of Queen Silver, as it is now, the atheist movement, the humanist, and the free thought movements 
have been predominantly managed by people in their late 30s, late 40s, or beyond. Um, now that can change. Here we are at the beginning of the 21st century, standing on the threshold of the new millennium. That can change. But one thing we can pretty much state with certainty is that in the days of the 20th century, the realm of atheism, free thought, and humanism has pretty much been dominated, not by the younger members of society, but by the older members of society. Here in the 1920s, I believe it would be the mid to late 1920s, Queen and her mother settled here in Los Angeles and opened up a bookstore. Queen, uh, Queen's mother was very involved in the socialist movement at that time, and they opened up a socialist bookstore, which was attacked by those who did not appreciate socialism. And her reputation as an atheist, notwithstanding, it was her openly socialist views, I think, that was mainly responsible for the destruction of the book, uh, of the bookstore. Well, there are things there that I don't don't talk about for one thing because they're very unpleasant memories. But the bookstore fell a victim to anti-progressive feelings in the period imme immediately following World War One, in the period of the 1919, 1920, 1921, uh, very similar to things that happened later on in the McCarthy era, and the bookstore was destroyed and the books were taken out and burned. Queen was very sharp tongue as a young girl, and between the ages of, say, 8 to 13, it was cute. People, people enjoyed seeing a young girl spouting off all these insults at some of the great luminaries of the time, like William Jennings Bryan. But as Queen got closer to the age of 15, when she became a teenager, suddenly having a sharp tongue and a sharp wit was just no longer cute. And in addition to alienating herself from Christians, which <laughs> that was pretty much always the case, she wound up alienating herself from various free thinkers, including um, Haldeman Julius, who published a series of blue books uh, that espoused different things about atheism, great essays, classics. But Queen raked his wife over the coals because she celebrated the Christmas holidays. And in time, people just began to tire of her total divisiveness and just suddenly began to drop her and not want to have anything to do with her. Well, as Wendy points out in her book, Grace uh, had one last hurrah where she went up into um, Seattle and uh, Portland and then eventually into Washington, or not Washington, Alaska, for a speaking tour. And didn't do too well. She almost starved to death in Alaska, and then eventually Grace returns back to Los Angeles. Um, she and Queen make the very conscious decision to withdraw from activism. It's a very conscious choice. And they had some really hard times. Queen never really resurfaced back into activism until the 70s when uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare's American Atheist was going on full stream. Uh, Queen's mother, of course, had died by this time, and Queen's, as an elder woman, became, I guess, what we should call um, the greatest atheist matriarch we ever had. Well, Queen had decided that she was going to go to work, and she had, and she had managed to save enough money to buy the house, and her and her mother had and lived there until her mother died. As I understand it, Don came in through Queen to American Atheists. Now, I could be wrong on this, so I hesitate to even mention it, but they both joined at approximately the same time. And from that point on, they were pretty much together because they were mutual soulmates, if you will, or non-soulmates, if there is such a term. And they both, whenever we had meetings, one would be accompanied by the other. Queen did not drive, and so her only way of getting to a meeting or any type of event was to take public transportation or else rely on a friend or somebody else to take her there. And so usually that other person was Don, and Don was a very, uh, Don is a very good person. Don was always there for Queen and always drove her around and provided transportation for her. My brother had seen a television show and he saw George Smith and uh, George Smith was talking about his book called Atheism, The Case Against God. And 
my brother said, oh, you got to see this guy. He's good, you know. So I called the station and said, can I get a hold of this guy? So I got a hold of him, and he said, I said, you know, do you have some group or something? And he said, I don't, but uh, you can call this number. And he gave me Queen Silver's number. So I called her, and uh, she she said, yeah, we have this group. You're welcome to come to meetings or at my house. And she lived in Hollywood on Seward Avenue. And uh, she sent me a, a letter that I anxiously awaited. And I got it the day before. Well, it signed out the day before my birthday in 1978. And, uh, and Don Latimer had signed it as president or director. And she was the treasurer secretary. And had a little note, a little personal note, which she used to always do to all the letters. And uh, signed it in her own green ink. And uh, so that was really the first time you know, I talked to her on the telephone, and I got that letter from her. And then I went to the first atheist meeting I ever went to. And the only reason I wanted to come into the atheist, the only thing I was really interested in is books, because I couldn't find any books. Because when I went to the library, the books I'd find were about atheism were all anti-atheism. <laughs> and uh, so I went to Queen Silver's house, and it was this little old um, place that reminded me of my grandmother's house in L.A. And... Um, it, her house was in Hollywood with lots of flowers around it and she had tons of junk all piled all over her house but they had this table out with all these amazing atheist books that I'd never seen before or heard of so uh, she introduced me to all the great atheist authors like Joseph McCabe and Joseph Lewis and Robert Ingersoll when I first attended most of the people as is the case now were quite a bit older than I, than I was and John was more in my peer group, and uh, he kind of took me under his wing, and uh, I felt some commonality with John. He's a, he's a fun guy. And he, uh, uh, he uh, kind of brought me up to speed on atheism because I had not been involved in organized atheism up to that point. So uh, we attended, I, I met him actually, I, I believe, I, yeah, I did meet him. At a uh, at a meeting of atheist of American atheists that was held at Queen Silver's home, uh, and um, I think Don Latimer was president and she was secretary or something like that. They, uh, I believe that was what they were at the time. Met John there, and also met Don Latimer and Queen for the first time. And I must say, uh, right from the beginning here, I was a relatively young guy. For, for atheist activists in any way. And uh, I thought, oh boy, here's this old lady and I'm meeting in this old lady's home and with all the books around and kind of the stuffiness that an old lady uh, has, some old ladies have. And uh, I, I thought, well, boy, this, uh, I don't know if I want to really participate in the organization that much, but John uh, told me that, she, that the... Uh, People like Don and, and Queen were very sharp and had a lot to a lot that we could learn. And uh, I then gradually, as time went on, as I became more active, I realized that uh, uh, Queen w remained more active than Don at a after a certain point. I realized that uh, she was a, definitely a wise head that we could turn to for her advice, her nod of approval, or her reservations to find out what they were. Her input was important to us because she had very, very good perspective on atheism, church-state separation, all the related matters. Became very, uh, I became quite an admirer of her, especially when I became uh, very active and on the board and everything. I, I was always kind of interested. Well, what's Queen think about this? Let's see what she said. One of the meetings, um, I believe, it was the Detroit meeting. They gave Queen the uh, an award. I think it was like a you know Pioneer of Atheism award. I think it was, and. Uh, so Madeline O'Hare gave her that award and said she, you know, read off a lot of the great things that she had done, and uh, so it was really amazing because she had done quite a bit. And then I, um, when she was out here, when Madeline O'Hare was out here, Queen suggested we have the uh, we have the winter solstice banquet at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood because she really knew Hollywood and it's a great banquet, big 
really nice banquet. And uh, so Queen Silver, of course, uh, was a prime mover in this thing, and we had her in there um, speaking and helping organize. And, and uh, so they talked to each other. They were cordial to each other when I saw them. It seems to have been a fairly good relationship during the 1970s when she, when she and Madeline were actively working together for the atheist movement. Um, none of the stories that I can recall offhand would be of particular interest to the crowd, I mean, to the audience, but it's just, it was, it was a working relationship. There wasn't any overt hostility. Queen had the books. She had some very old free thought books that were not available generally. Things that have been given to her by other people because Queen was always out in front of in many areas and Madeline had wanted Queen to give her uh, certain books and Queen said basically that you can have them when I die but you're not about to get them now and Madeline was very put out with Queen. On top of that, I need to be careful about how I phrase this now because I'll, I'll make, uh, I'll give people impressions that aren't so. Because Madeline did a great deal of very good work for atheists. Uh, she got things off the ground, she got publicity, she built organizations. There were things that Madeline was very good at. But Madeline had personality problems, not, not in the psychological sense, but she was a battle axe. I think it'd be about as good a term as, as, as I can think of. And she could not get along with people very well. At the time, I was a president of the chapter of, uh, I, su I succeeded, uh, uh, I succeeded John Edwards as president of the local chapter, the Southern California chapter of American Atheists. And uh, uh, we, the two of us were very aggressive about trying to do things with the organization and so forth. Uh, and I ran into some problems with Madeline whom I basically kind of hero worshipped at that point. I even went. I was the. I went down to Austin, Texas, uh, to meet with her. I got the very first uh, organizational manual, uh, which I was pushing for an organizational manual for chapters. Uh, I got the very first issue of that that came out. <coughs> and uh, and I. But I found that uh, when I, after I was president, that she became a bit what should we say, a little more high-handed, uh, more difficult to deal with, and so forth. After I had, had resigned uh, from the local organization, uh, they had started uh, putting up a, a display in Santa Monica in, in the Christmas season when, uh, when another religious organization had, had put displays up there. Well, we couldn't get them to stop. And we didn't have the money to sue uh, the Santa Monica City. Uh, the best that we could do would be to uh, get our own display up there. Well, Madeline was very much opposed to that. Uh, there, there was, in a sense, it legitimized the other side, uh, side's displays. and. Alan wanted this not to do that. Uh, the thing that kind of brought things to a head was the fact that uh, the local chapter decided to participate in the um, in having a booth along the same stretch of the Pacific Ocean Park that overlooks the ocean where they had the winter solstice, I mean the uh, uh, Christmas uh, nativity scenes. And we could have either fought it uh, or participated with an atheist booth to counter their arguments. And the local chapter decided to have a booth there that we wouldn't get very far in fighting it, so to have a booth there to counterbalance it somewhat.
and we um, we voted to do that. And when Madeline heard of it, she was against it. Uh, frankly, I tended to be a bit against it too. Well, I, I tended to go more for at, at Madeline's position than the, the local chapter did. I was president at the time and, and was uh, and went along with the majority. And uh, when the word got back to her, uh, she uh, uh, actually it was Garth, her son who just came back with really nasty comments uh, in a letter uh, berating people uh, for everything that he that possibly came to his mind uh, triggered by those events and uh, I in corresponding with him I found out this was someone I couldn't deal with and then Madeline backed him at some point started backing him and I, and we, I, <coughs> I didn't want to try to work with her anymore she was a very bright woman, done a lot for atheism and all, but had a very uh, abrasive personality, and I, don't, I didn't need that. Life's too short. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to, because I can't work with her, and she's berating me, and, and her son is berating me, I will resign as president and just let someone else take over as president. Madeline was the kind of person you, you, you could not disagree with. Uh, what would happen was, if Madeline was unhappy about something, she'd send you a really nasty letter. Well, we never really did anything wrong, and we would send her back a very polite and, and very uh, to-the-point letter uh, pointing out the facts and explaining that we hadn't done anything. Well, we did that once, and the second, next letter from Madeline was even worse than the first one. And if you were to write back to her a second time, you'd get a third letter, which is even worse than the first two. And Madeline was not above cussing people out. Uh, there were probably no four-letter words that she didn't know, and she did not mind using them. One, one interesting portion of Wendy's book deals with Queen giving advice to Madeline. Uh, Queen remembers how abrasive she has been toward people like Hogman Julius. And she basically tries to steer Madeline away from her abrasive behavior and from obnoxious comments. And she tries to explain to her how it, it just doesn't work. It, Madeline hears this and Queen tells her, you know, before you sit down to write a letter, think about it. Think about it before you go back and actually write it. And Madeline hears Queen's advice and decides not to take it and as you might say the rest is history. So when I announced that to the board uh, they to my and I explained everything to them to my it wasn't to my surprise that they kind of agreed with me but what really shocked me was that the whole board resigned en masse uh, from their positions as uh, as uh, the board of uh, American Atheists in uh, Southern California chapter. And Queen, who I thought probably would want to keep things stable and come more quiet and, and, less, and have a less aggressive stance than I would tend to have about these matters, she was one of them who very much went along too in support of, uh, of my position. Very much a surprise to me. Um, uh, gratifying, but a, a surprise. When we were at our board meetings and discussing things that Madeline O'Hare was doing, she would give the rationale for what Mad for where Madeline was coming from, but at the same time, she didn't approve of a lot of the things that she was doing, and especially uh, when she was uh, when Madeline O'Hare had uh, sent things to uh, Dick James saying. Uh, you know, uh, basically insulting him, um, you know, after he was very upfront and straight with him. And so when Dick James wanted to resign from Atheist United, uh, from American Atheists quietly, uh, he, he wanted to do it quietly. He said, I'd like somebody else just to step in. This is voluntary group. I don't, I don't want to deal with this, so, you know, I'll just like to step down. I don't want to disrupt anything. But the entire board, including Queen Silver, resigned in 
uh, solidarity with Dick. Queen did mention the fact that Madeline could be a very difficult person to work with, but that was pretty much about it. She didn't really, she's not what we call today a Madeline basher because a lot of people tend to either take one extreme or another with regard to Madeline saying that she's either a terrible, horrible person or else that she's a, I guess, a venerated saint of atheism. There was, there was nothing to be gained by, by throwing mud at Madeline. I think it's very fitting that in the latter days of Queen's life, she found herself on Venice Beach uh, as one of the operators of the Atheists United table. We have an outreach table at Venice Beach on the boardwalk. It's staffed in large part by members of Atheists United, but it's also staffed by members of other free thought organizations which belong to the Alliance. So what are you guys doing down here on Venice Beach? We're out on the beach because we think that it's important that we present a united front for atheism. And we think that it's important that the general public realize that there is a rational alternative available to religious superstition. What we want to do is to present a positive image in so much as possible because we do get hostile people that come up to us from time to time. We try and present as positive an image for atheism as we can. And as I said, sometimes that is difficult. We do get people that come up that are overtly hostile and sometimes it becomes difficult. But with a little humor and a smile, I think that the atheist position but went out in the end. I mean, think about it. Here's a woman who, in her girlhood, between 8 to 13, was at the free speech corner at the day, at, during the early days of the 20th century. And now, during the latter days of the 20th century, she's at another very famous free speech corner, Venice Beach. Well, the best thing that the people can tell us is when they come over and say, Wow, am I glad to see you here. I never thought that I would see an atheist table here at Venice Beach. But then, Venice Beach is what it is. It's the third biggest attraction in Southern California. The first time I went to Venice Beach, she was there with Don Latimer, and they always were a team because she wasn't driving. So Don was the driver. That's why he took her places. And she always arranged the table her way and it had to be just so. Uh, also, uh, she was an extremely uh, intelligent person. She had answers that uh, I had to learn from. In fact, uh, lots of my answers were kind of imitation of hers, I have to admit, because she was extremely witty, and uh, we all admired her wit and her uh, expressionism. She was very expressive. And the reaction has been extremely positive. We've had much more positive reaction than we have negative. But I was struck by the number of people who pass the table and give us the thumbs up signal or smile and wave at us or call out and say we're glad you're here and keep up the good work. And this is wonderful. We love to hear this. But we would also like these people, uh, many of whom, when we talk to them, say, well, I'm a free thinker, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I'm a humanist, but. So I have been calling them free thinkers, but, or atheists, but. And those are the people that I would like to talk to, both men and women, and especially the younger group that is coming up now that we need to have people who are prepared to get active and to do something about their non-belief. She, uh, she one time had a scientist uh, asking her, how come that you are not religious? After all, you seem a very intelligent old lady, and I'm a scientist, and somehow I do believe in the superpower, uh, because uh, he, he gave us intelligence. So she answered him, if he gave you intelligence, why don't you use it? <laughs> and we thought that was the greatest answer ever. Interviewed Queen here on Superstition, Talking Snakes, Unjust Taxes, and Nonsense, I was uh, very cognizant of it being a special occasion. Partly because our producer, Lauren Peck, had to go uh, to a little extra effort to bring her to the studio in Long Beach, having had to pick her up in Hollywood so she wouldn't have to hop a bus down here. Yeah, the bus to the Blue Line to... Long Beach, 
or on a bus or taxi to the studio, uh, which I wouldn't let her do. When Don uh, wasn't able to take her, as Don Ottoman, when he wasn't able to, to bring her proper terminology, well, I just went up to Hollywood and picked her up, which made a long taping day, I'll tell you for sure. <laughs> Go to Hollywood and pick her up and bring her back and do the taping and then uh, take her home. But she was a very articulate lady. When I interviewed Queen, I was very impressed by her camera demeanor because she's really perfect for the medium of television. She is not what you call a hot subject. She didn't speak in a loud manner, but she was extremely smooth and articulate. She had her wrapped down about her entire life. Very soft-spoken woman on camera, but she had this very intriguing, shy little smile that would break out every once in a while when she'd make a very wry little comment or aside. And after the taping, Lauren and Queen and I all went out to lunch at Spires. And I was also impressed by her physical agility, how nimble she was. I did uh, hold her hand over steps and rough spots in the road, but other than that, uh, she moved at a, a pretty rapid clip. She was a, an extremely well-balanced individual in terms of her mental faculties, physical faculties. And while I didn't see her much uh, toward the very end of her life, I, I know that up until very nearly, up until nearly the end, she was really um, in great possession of all the, the wonderful memories and faculties she had honed over a lifetime. At the time I first got involved in the free thought movement, I was not particularly knowledgeable about the free thought movement because such things are generally not available in the public domain. And so, for example, there was a series of books that were printed in the 1920s, small books called Little Blue Books. Paul and Julius Company printed these. And they printed a number of books by Joseph McCabe, who was an ex-Catholic, and he was a scholar of the Christian Church, the Catholic Church. And I remember Queen mentioning this man to me, who I'd never heard of before. And one day we were out at Venice Beach at our outreach table, and Queen said, I have something for you. I said, okay, what's that? And so she reached in her bag and she pulled out this clear bag in which she had put 29 different little blue books, which are classics and virtually impossible to find now. And of course, my mouth just watered and I thanked her profusely for it. And I read all of them within a few months of that. And so that really gave me a good historical foundation for the free thought movement, so I'm indebted to her for that. I remember saying to Queen once about some kind of strategy. Now, Queen, I'm tired of being a gadfly. And she said, well, I'm not. And she never did tire of saying exactly what she felt was the truth and standing up against any any giant who wanted to be a tired. I get a call from Queen one night that she was really very, very sick. And, uh, well, she said she was going to call Kaiser, and so I hung up and immediately called Kaiser myself to make sure that she had called, because we really have a thing about hospitals and ambulances and all that stuff, and uh, she had called them, so I figured that everything was all right. Well, it sort of was. Queen uh, was not willing to, to go by ambulance. Uh, and she didn't tell me this, but I know her. Um, she is or was uh, very claustrophobic, seriously claustrophobic. And if you go by ambulance, they tie you down on a gurney. And she was not about to allow that. So she called a friend that lives in Altadena, a uh, family friend that uh, she had known for years, uh, Sylvia Valle. And Sylvia came over and took me to the hospital. The queen 
had never been overnight in a hospital except shortly after she was born at age 10 days. Uh, her and her mother left the hospital in Portland. And uh, until the time she had the serious illness when she called me, uh, she'd never been a, a overnight in a hospital. And she really didn't want to go. I mean, uh, she would not have gone if, if she had the slightest indication that she could have managed without it. So we have the, the uh, health problems. Um, she had uh, the, the claustrophobia. <coughs> she had told me that if she got to the point where she could not stay there, there was one place where she could go and stay. Now, the name of that place is Sunset Hall. And it's run by the First Unitarian Church. And there are people there who have uh, been politically active uh, on the left and who figured that she would be able to, to put up with that. She wouldn't be wanting to go to uh, an ordinary place where people like that usually go. It would have been just impossible from her point of view. Well, anyhow, she wasn't well enough to go to Sunset Hall. I turned her down. And uh, when you told me that she didn't ever want to be in a position where she was confined to a hospital bed with tubes coming out of her. Unfortunately, that is what happened. Queen wound up in a hospital, and it was a very unpleasant time. But eventually, Queen was to get some reprieve when she appeared at the Atheist United Solstice Banquet. And here, thanks to John Edwards, we have a brief clip of Queen's final appearance before the public. Thank you all so very, very, very much. In my career in the free thought movement, which goes from 1917 to 1997, I have never been arrested. I can't tell you why. <laughs> I have no good excuse. <laughs> well, you didn't tell me that, uh, uh, that uh, when she died that she wanted to be uh, cremated and her, and her ashes uh, uh, scattered at sea. And that's what happened. Queen Silver's legacy to atheism, I think more than any other thing she did, is her very example, which is to say that amid a lifetime of campaigning, pamphleteering, speaking out on behalf of free thought, she ended her life, as always, with dignity and without rancor or bitterness. She was exemplary in the kind of person I would want to be and do want to be if I could reach at the age she reached and still be a hopeful human being and not be consumed by hatred, still have uh, the verve and the energy to promote her agenda, and to do it in a way that was uh, extremely entertaining. Queen's real value to my way of thinking for Atheist United was as sort of a cornerstone of rationality, if I can coin a phrase. And what I mean by that is that anytime you have an organization, you have leadership. And anytime you have leadership, you have a lot of people that are trying to get together on any given issue. And when we have our board meetings, there's a lot of things that come out and people tend to get involved, sidetracked on things, get, get involved in side issues, things of that nature. And Queen was always the one that we could rely on to 
act as sort of the voice of reason within an organization that is supposed to be based on reason. And so she really helped to bring us home sometimes because sometimes we would stray off on different tangents and what have you. We always thought we owned Queen in the atheist movement, but the libraries thought they owned Queen. She was at every library book sale all over town, and the ACLU thought they owned Queen. She was on the board of the uh, Humanist Association of Los Angeles. So that's, that's another thing I, I remember about Queen, and then of course everybody remembers her independence. Queen Silver as I said before, was a pioneer of atheism, and thanks to her, we can go to Venice Beach and distribute our literature, because uh, otherwise, I don't think we would be able to do that. And all that is because of her pioneering and people like her that came before and risked their lives and their, their happiness so as to put atheism on the map somehow. And we are the ones that continue what she started and we hope that we will be able to grow although we grow slowly but if we don't show ourselves we will never grow queen was one of the cornerstones of free thought 